I celebrate my mother and my father. Every time I see you, I am reminded of what it looks like to model biblical fatherhood and motherhood. And so I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity. God bless you. And my brother Adeolu is somewhere. I bless God for him. I thank God. Jelly is like family to me. Like Michael said, Michael, Dami, and Afolabi, we've known ourselves for, let's not say how long. But it is with Jesus' joy that I am here today to bring what I believe is a word of encouragement and also the beginnings of a blueprint of what to do after this weekend is over. And so let us pray. My Father and my God, I thank you because the entrance of your word brings light and it brings understanding to the simple. If you don't help us, we cannot be helped. If you don't save us, we cannot be saved. But I thank you, Father, because the power of the Most High is what overshadows us. I thank you, Father, because you sit in heaven and the earth is your footstool. I thank you because you are the one who measures the universe with the span of your hand. That is the person that we call Father. That is the person that we call God. And so, Father, we are not like those who pray to a God that does not have life, cannot do anything, is lifeless, does not have power. We pray to the most high, the most powerful one, the one who speaks and the earth begins to take shape and form. So, Lord, we believe that every word that you speak to us this weekend will begin to take shape and form in our lives in the name of Jesus. We will not be like those who hear and then we move on with our lives like nothing happened. I thank you, Father, because indeed this weekend is the moment where we can say to ourselves that indeed we experienced a deeper level of spiritual awakening in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you, Father, oh God. I move out of your way. Do what only you can do. Stare up, O oh God, the bowels of our hearts. Stare up, O oh God, the wombs of our spirit. Incubate, O oh God, things that will stand the test of time, saviors for our generations and beyond. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Today's message I have titled, Into the Deep. Into the Deep. And when I because I, I like to pretend like I don't understand English sometimes, you know, because there are some ways that we're so used to words that we believe that we know what they mean when we hear them. Spiritual awakening, of course I know what that means. It means that I wake up. But wake up from what? Wake up into what? And so I went to Google. So that I think Pastor Ayoda said yesterday that reading the Bible is even just a lesson in English, right? Awakening. What does awakening mean? And it says waking from sleep or an act or moment of becoming suddenly aware of something. And I felt the Lord say, this is that. This is that moment. This is that Kairos moment. I don't know what are the steps that led you here today, whether you came because this is your home church, or you came because somebody invited you, or you came because you wanted to just be in the presence of other believers, or you came because you truly desired a spiritual awakening. Whatever your reason for being here, I'm here to tell you that you have entered a spiritual one chance. You have been blindly implicated. This is your Kairos moment. So even if you are here discouraged, wondering, does God see me? Has my season passed? I'm just here to encourage the next generation. No. No. The spiritual awakening is for everybody. And so my text today is Luke chapter 5 from verse 1 to 11. And I will read and then I will break it down the way that the Lord has explained it to me. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Generaset, or Gener, Generaset, And immediately, I asked God, I said, why would they mention the lake? Every time I see something like that in the Bible, I'm like, for you to put it there, it must have some significance. And so... 
The lake is another name for the Sea of Galilee. But then it says it doesn't even qualify to be a sea. It is more like a mini lake because it only measures uh, 8 by 13 miles. And so the Lord was saying to me, he said, there are some people here who feel like they have to accomplish the tasks, the assignments, the ministries, the businesses, the careers, the different things that the Lord has asked them to accomplish, but with limited resources. You think that the Lord is calling you to do stuff and you're like, Lord, I don't even have the right pool. I don't even have the right, the right amount. I don't even have all that is required for this thing that you're asking me to do. And the Lord wants you to know today that he sees you and because he is in your boat, you have more than you require for what he's asked you to do. And so it says, the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God. And he stood and he saw there might be a multitude here pressing to hear, to be awakened. But I want you to know today that the Lord sees you. As if you were the only person in this room, the Lord sees you. He sees you. He sees you. Jehovah El Roy is in the room. He sees you. He sees you. And then he sees two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. The fishermen were in proximity. They were in proximity to the assignment. <laughs> they were close enough for you to imagine that they were where they were supposed to be. But they had left their boats and they were washing their nets. My question to you this morning is, are you washing your nets prematurely? Have you left that assignment? Have you left that relationship? Now, I always have to add a caveat when I say this, because if God has, is the one that told you to leave the relationship, please leave yesterday. But are there partnerships? Are there careers? Are there businesses? Are there ministries? that you have left because for you, you are like, I'm tired. Has tiredness and disappointment moved you out of position? Are you in proximity to God's promise and to the promise keeper, yet you are washing your nets in defeat or despondence? That, I believe, is one of the things that the Lord wants to address through this weekend. Where, where you have felt defeat, where you have felt despondence, where you have felt like, Lord, how shall these things be? I'm tired. If you leave me, I've dusted my passports on a one-way train to the Canadian borders. If you leave me, I'm going to go back to that job, to that career that I know that you called me from because this business that you've asked me to do is no longer working. This ministry, this assignment, they don't appreciate me. So I'm better off with these walls. I'm better off protecting my heart. I'm better off hiding myself. A lot of us have gotten used to hiding in plain sight. If you've grown up in church, you know how to do it well. We know how to lift up holy hands. We know how to appear like everything is working fine. How are you? We bless God. How are you? God is on the throne. Where are you? Lift head far above. We know the Christianese. We know what to say. We know how to say it. In fact, some of us have gotten used to when they ask us, how are you doing? You know they don't really care about the answer. So you've gotten used to say, I'm, I'm fine. All is good. But Jehovah Elroy, who sees all and who knows all, knows that you have checked out knows that the disappointments, the unanswered prayers, the seemingly failed prophecies have caused you to say, do you know what? I'm done with this boot. But today, can we say today? Today, today, today is the day that all of that changes in the name of Jesus. And so I've identified what the problem is. The next step is the process. And the process, back to Luke chapter 5, it says, verse 3, Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, 
and asked him to put out a little from the land. It's time. It's time for you to surrender your boat to God again. It's time for him, you to give it back to him. It's time for you to say, Lord, I've tried it. I've reached the end of my rope. And God is like, that's okay. I'm here. Give me the boat again. And so Jesus gets into the boat. And so the first level of surrender is that he's tired. That's Peter, or Simon Peter. He's tired. He doesn't say, Lord, there are two boats here. Please choose the other one. I've been walking all night. I'm tired. But he has that little trust again. And he says, you know what? You are the Messiah. You can have my boat. And so Jesus asks him to put out a little bit from the shore. And for some of us, being here is that little bit. Because you could have been doing anything on this Saturday. You could have, there are many weddings. There are many, I don't know what they do on Saturdays. This day. I'm usually in my house if I don't have to be out. But there are different things you could be doing. And you came here. That is you setting out from the shore. That is you separating yourself from the multitude. That is you accepting that maybe, just maybe, I can find hope again. Maybe, just maybe. But you know another thing that setting out from the shore does? It reminds you that you are consecrated. It reminds you that you are not like everybody else. It reminds you that there's something unique about you that God wants to use. It also takes patience. Because now that Jesus is in your boat and he wants to use your boat to teach, it means that unlike the multitude, you cannot just get up and go. The process will take patience. Let me not look for trouble. It will take patience. It will take patience. It will also mean that you are separating yourself from group activities into deeper intimacy. It will mean that some of those things that have been crutches, they are good. But it gets to a level on your journey of consecration where it is you and God. So all the group prayer calls, they are good, but they are add-ons. They are not the main thing. It means that the things that you have used to substitute your work with God, they got to go. I often ask when people say, I say, spend time with God, you know, and they say, can I listen to a sermon? And I ask them, I say, it's like Iwisi and I were sitting at a table. And then Adeolu comes and he asks Iwisi, tell me about Esther. Tell me about Esther. Tell me about Esther. If Iwisi is a good friend, she will say, Esther is sitting in front of you. Ask her about herself. A lot of times we substitute other people's revelation for what God wants to reveal to you one-on-one -on -one in the secret place. It is time. It is time. Yes, you have developed the discipline of waking up at four, at five, at six to spend time in prayer. But then I also say, imagine that you are going on a date and you carry 400 of your friends along. What kind of date would that be? So if you want to develop intimacy with God, you got to find time to spend time with him, what? One on one. No matter how strong the person is that you are dating, all 400 of you, you know that at best all you will get is one sentence. But if you spend that hour with the Lord, your life will not be the way it is. Your family will not be the way it is. The nation will not be the way it is. The world will not be the way it is. God is calling us into deeper intimacy with him. And it starts from realizing that the call is into consecration. The call is into being set apart so that you can enter into all that God has for you in this season and beyond. And then, we know that when Jesus used to teach, he didn't used to spend two minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes. They used to tarry in his presence, right? So, Peter is tired, and he has to sit down and hear Jesus teach. And he's sitting there patiently because he can't leave. Jesus is in his boat. But guess who is the first recipient of all that Jesus is saying? It's not the multitude. He has direct access to the words that are coming out of the Savior's mouth. And so as he's sitting there, hope is being rekindled. As he's sitting there, 
he's beginning to leap again. He's like, ah, this person that is sitting in my boat is the one that has fed 5,000, is the one that has healed people, is the one that has raised people from the dead. He's the one that's in my boat. And so for some of you, you will sit here and you will hear the Lord begin to rekindle hope in your heart. You begin to remember who God is because you are forgotten. You remember we'll sing that song, I have made you too small in my eyes and I have believed in a lie that you're unable to help me. But now, oh Lord, I see my wrong. There's so many things that if you really knew who God was, you will not be afraid. And so you sit there patiently hearing the word of God, rekindling the hope again. Letting you know who is so that you can know who you are. Identity is drawn from knowing who your father is. You are forgotten. You are forgotten. And the Lord wants to begin to rekindle in your heart and in your mind an idea, an understanding of who the one that you call father is. And so he's sitting there. Maybe even the Lord uses his boat as an example to teach. Uses him. And so for some of you, you have already, you know, you have, you have because you say, well, you know, Lord, the thing didn't work, but I can now mentor others on what not to do. Maybe I can now use my life as a teaching moment. And the Lord is just saying, be patient. This is just for what? A season. It is just for a time. And then he said, when he had stopped speaking, There's a time when the Lord deems in his heart that you have fully heard him, that hope has been reawakened, that you are ready, your thinking has been rewired. For some of us, we're going to experience mindset shifts that will help us enter into the fullness of all that God will require us to enter in this season. And so we surrender in this weekend and beyond to God's teaching and we allow him to prepare our hearts and our minds for the promise. And so he says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. Have you ever wondered why prophetic words keep coming round and round? You are like, ah, Lord, this is the fourth person that is telling me that you have a purpose for my life. This is the fifth person that is telling me that I'm going to have a great ministry. This is the seventeenth person that's telling me I'm going to go global. But if we're being honest, Lord, I've not seen it. I've never smelt it. But do you wonder why the Lord keeps repeating those prophetic words? Because there are times in your heart and in your mind where you have questioned it. Where you're like, Lord, is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And so every time you are despondent, the Lord sends a word of encouragement. This thing is still speaking over your life. He says it so that you can remember. So that you know that the season has not ended. But that season is waiting for you to enter into partnership with the Lord. And so, you may be tired. You may have given up. But it's time to launch out again. It's time to launch out again. It's time to launch out again, but this time, the waters are deeper. This time, it requires more. This time, it requires deeper levels of consecration. This time, it requires deeper levels of dedication. This time, it requires deeper levels of sacrifice. Launch out into the deep. The promise that you are looking for is not in shallow waters, it is in the Verse 5, but Simon said, Simon said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, 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 nevertheless. For some of us, we're entering into our nevertheless moment. Nevertheless, 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 nevertheless. Lord, I don't care. Yes, I have been hurt. Yes, I have been disappointed. Yes, I have been heartbroken. Yes, it looks like things have not worked out the way that I thought that they should work out. Lord, it's true, I have given up. Yes, it looks like I have told, I have put so much effort, time into this thing and nothing seems to have worked. But today you decide, Lord, nevertheless. 
Make up your mind nevertheless, nevertheless, nevertheless. Because you remember who is calling you. Remember who is talking to you. He is both the promise giver and the promise keeper. Nevertheless, nevertheless, at your word. Some of us need to seek the Lord for a word. The same Peter said, at your word, bid me come. What is the word that the Lord has issued to you in this season? Do you know it? Have you sought him for it? It is that word that will allow you to walk on water. It is that word that will allow you to catch what you have never caught before in your life. What is the word that is speaking over you? What is the word for your season? Do you know it? At your word. Not at my plan. Not at my agenda. Not on my timeline. At your word. It is that word that gives you the courage to go again in a nevertheless moment. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, regardless of how I feel, if you are speaking it, then I am doing it in the name of Jesus. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. That is the position that the Lord wants us to enter into. And it says in verse 6, and when they had done this, meaning what? Obedience produces results. Obedience. Obedience. Quick obedience. It's not sharing with your friends. Look what the Lord showed me. Oh, the Lord just gave me this revelation today. He showed me this five years ago. Oh, you people are young in the, in the body. He showed me this thing 15, 15 years ago. Sirs, ma, sisters, brothers, this revelation that the Lord showed you five, 15, 20 years ago, what did you do with it? It's time for things to move from your journal into action. Our journals are full. Full. This is what the Lord said. I always get confused if I'm being honest. When people tell me, the Lord said this, but I said, you said what? You said no. Ah, you're doing well. I'm being sarcastic. You're doing very badly. Because you don't know who God is. How can he issue a command and you are saying, the Lord said, but I said there are other people that are able to do it better than me. Lord, you don't see my weakness. You don't see me. Do you know? Lord, I know that you are a good God, but if you know how I spoke to somebody yesterday, you will not be entrusting me with anything that concerns any other human life. We have our excuses, fool. But I ask people, I say, imagine your child comes to tell you, I want to do this. But I don't feel like I'm able. I don't feel like I'm powerful. As the parents, do you clap for your child? Do you say, it's true? Do you give them a pat on the back? And say, oh, you're so humble. Because that's what we think it is. We think that it is humility. But it's actually a form of pride. When my friend said it to me, I almost fainted. Because in my life, I would never have thought that this level of humility I thought I was experiencing was actually inverted pride. God says that you are something and you tell him, no, no, no. You don't know me. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I do. God, the creator of the universe, spoke to you. And you told him what? You cannot say that Prophetic words have not come to pass. You cannot say that God has not moved in your life if he has given you instructions and you have disobeyed them. So this thing about being angry with God for the perceived unfulfillment of prophecies and promises, it has to stop. Go back to those journals. What did he ask you to do? And please do it with speed. The answers to your promises, the answers to your prophecies are locked in those acts of obedience. And because they don't look like it, the Lord says, oh, send a kind word, do something. I want you to start coming on your Instagram and preaching. And it doesn't look like, how does this make me a kingdom financier? How does this make me a... God's maths is not your maths. When the Bible says in Psalms that his ways are not our ways, neither are his thoughts our thoughts, it wasn't a suggestion. It is the actual fact. His maths is not 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. His maths is 4 times 16 is equal to 17 billion. So why are you trying to use your brain to figure it out? Do your own part and let him do what? His part. 
And when they had done this, when they had done this, power is not made available until you move. Until you move. Until you step out of the boat. Until you let down your nets again. Until you do what he has asked you to do, you will not experience power. Meanwhile, you are saying, God, if you are really God, show me a sign. I'm going to sit in my bedroom and I'm going to make this assignment fall on me in the name of Jesus. Someone is going to come and say, do you know what? I sense in my spirit that the Lord is asking you to do this business. Here is the CAC document. <laughs> wow. Wow. Wow unto what? Wow unto you. Wow. He's asked you to start a business. What's the business name? Let's start from there. If you don't know, ask him. Ask him. As human beings, we get frustrated when we give people instructions and they don't move. How much more good that we are made in his own image and in his likeness. Move. You may not see the end. Because I always say that if you are a detailed person, the Lord will show you big picture. If you are a big picture person, the Lord will show you details. Why? Because more important to him than the assignment is the relationship. He wants you to depend on him every step of the way. But some of us are just waiting. Just tell me what to do, Lord. I know you have seven billion children. Don't worry about me. I'm just going to run. You understand? When I get stuck, I'll call you, okay? And God is like, no, you were created for relationship. So if I give you the first step, trust that I know the rest of the journey is mapped out. You don't worry. Just follow me step by step. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. The proof of true surrender is obedience. Is obedience. So we stop the excuses and we move in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were breaking. It meant that these nets that they had used to fish, sometimes full, sometimes never full, but it had never gotten to the point where the catch was so great that the nets started to break. You see, eh? it's not just enough to do spiritual awakening. When you have been awakened, ask the Lord, for the structures that will help carry that which the Lord wants to birth in and through you in this season and beyond. Because if you are not prepared, it will break your nets. If you are not prepared. So the Lord says, I want you to have a global business. Yet you have not settled your family structure. How will it work? The Lord says, I want you still on business to do amazing things. Millions of dollars. Meanwhile... You are still using, I'm not a lawyer, don't quote me, but you're still using what? Business name. Are you ready? Are you practically ready for the answers to your prayers? Are you ready? Are you ready? This is the year that I marry in the name of Jesus. Okay, but have you listen to the Lord when he's talking to you about developing patience. No, you are the one. No grief for what? Anybody in 2024. How is it going to work? How? That no grief is not cause, you understand, boy, that no grief will grieve you out of your marriage with speed. So are you ready? Are you ready? Ask yourself, are you ready? Because the catch is coming. It is coming. God is looking for who to partner with in this season. But if the light that is within you is not stronger than the spotlight that shines upon you, you will break. And so it is the Lord's mercy that he hides you. It is the Lord's mercy that he points out the little foxes that spoil the vine. Because you have prayed too many dangerous prayers, you have attended too many meetings like this, for the Lord to allow his name to be tarnished because he gave you an opportunity too early. So, are you ready? Because the catch is coming. But when the Lord is putting his finger on anger, putting his finger on impatience, putting his finger on those things, I say, you know, by nature, I'm not really a patient person. I'm not really patient. And you know, if you try me, I just, I, I just, I lose my cool. I'll give you a piece of my mind. 
One day the Lord said, if you share your mind in different places, in pieces, what will be remaining? What will be remaining? Are you ready? Are you ready? Because yes, the world is desperately groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. And so the Lord is looking for people that he can partner with who will be walking billboards of his goodness and his godness. But at the end of the day, the person that must take the glory is God and God alone. So the question to you now is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Ask the Lord how to prepare for this power that you are seeking for him to release. Dearly, are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> are you ready? Ah. Because when the people are awakened, it's the next phase. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are ready. And their nets were breaking, verse 7 of Luke chapter 5. So they signal to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. What does this mean to us? It means that part of spiritual awakening is realizing that we are not in competition, we are in cooperation. We are not competing, we are what? Cooperating. You cannot successfully manage this great catch by yourself. The days of being a lone ranger is over. Just me and my God. I don't need anybody. Just me. I can do bad all by myself. That season may have worked for a season. But for this into the deep, this next level that the Lord is calling you into, you cannot do it by yourself. You need the right partnerships. And for some of us, trauma has locked us into saying, do you know what, I'm not going to trust anybody. I'm going to do it by myself. And if I can't do it by myself, then that is the limit or the replication of what God's asking me to do. But you are not just limiting your life. You are limiting the work or the outpouring of God in and through you. And so for this next level, ask the Lord, who are the partners? Who are the people that you are bringing into my life, into my ministry, into my career, into the assignments they have given to me that will help me navigate this new season? Where are the right partnerships, God? Ask the Lord for effective collaborations. But guess what? It says in Luke chapter 5, it says, and they came and filled both the boats. So it is not an unequal partnership. It's not like, oh, if I just pour myself into you, who will look after my own assignments? Those were things that we left when we were sleeping in the name of Jesus. Amen? Both boats were filled. But it said they began to sink. Ask God for the wisdom required to successfully navigate the partnerships that he's bringing your way in Jesus' name. But guess what? Unlike the other partnerships that failed, unlike the other things that did not last the test of time, because Jesus is in your boat, Jesus is the one that you are relying on, because Jesus is the one that you are leaning on, he will make sure that those boats do not sink in the name of Jesus. But there's a wisdom required. There's a wisdom required that you don't put the assignment over the people. There's a wisdom required to navigate. There's a wisdom required that you don't sacrifice friendships on the altar of ambition. There's a wisdom required. Because at the end of the day, it was the boats that were sinking. And these kingdom partnerships, these kingdom assignments, they must not sink. They must stand the test of time. Because God is looking for who to build with. And so we ask him for the wisdom to navigate in the name of Jesus. And it says, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The point of these answered prayers, the point of these amazing catches, these miracles, these answers to prayers, these mind-blowing, jaw-dropping testimonies, is to chase you into deeper levels of surrender. It's not to make you larger than life. 
It's not to make you aggrandize yourself. It's not to make you an oppressor of the people. It is for you to be so aware of the fact that you mean God, I never knew you could honor me this way. I never knew you could favor me this way. You don't begin to think, oh, I did it. It's because I'm eloquent. It's because I'm brilliant. It's because I'm a financial wizard. The aim of these things that you could not have done by yourself. The aim of God showing himself to be God in the different areas of your life is to remind you that without his super on your natural Your life is just ordinary. To remind you that the reason why you're walking in the things that you're walking in is because the Lord has decided to show you mercy, grace, and favor. It is to remind you of the goodness of God and the godness of God. And so it makes you fall to your knees in deeper surrender. It is the kindness of God that leads us into what? Repentance. It is also for those who are looking it is for those who are looking. It is for those who are looking because I always say that Christians were the worst advertisers of Christianity. Yeah. Yahoo boys, 419, cultists, ritualists, they don't need to advertise. They have waiting lists because their work speaks for itself. For well, Christians, You be the judge. You be the judge. And so when the Lord wants to begin to release these miracles, when he begins to release these signs and wonders, it's not for us to aggregate and say that my church is bigger than your church, better than your... No. No. I always say that the best form of evangelism is when people come up to you and say, I want to know your God. Show me your God. Show me. I know you now. We're in school together. Yes, you were brilliant. Yes, you were intelligent. But your life is not adding up. Something is happening. Who is your Godfather? And they introduce them to who? God the Father. That is the best form of evangelism. All who saw it were astonished. And so the testimonies that God works through us is to convict us and bring us and others closer to him. Hmm. Verse 10. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. It was never about the fish. It was never about the fish. It was never about the fish. It was never about the job. It was never about the marriage. It was never about the career. It was never about the ministry. It was never about the assignment. It was about the people. It was always about the people. Everything that God wants to do in and through you is not about you being the richest person in Africa or being, no. It's about what you do with what he has given to you to liberate other people. It is not about the platform. It is about the people. And so the Lord is looking for who he can trust in this season with those platforms that will realize that it's not about just me and my family being okay. But you have been put here on this planet at this time for such a time as this. And so the plan of it all, the crux of it all, the business of it all was this. Verse 11. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. He is the goal. He is the pursuit. He must be the overwhelming desire of our hearts. We move from his hand what he can give us, how he can bless us, to looking at his face and his face alone. Lord, when they see me, let them see you. Lord, wear me like a glove. I don't want them to see Esther. Esther is not interesting. There's nothing about Esther. But when they see you, families are changed. Businesses are changed. Wars are stopped. Deliverance comes because they see you. Lord, let them see Christ in me. In the name of Jesus. That is our earnest desire. 
That is our overwhelming pursuit. But everything, everything that I have shared is to show you the heart of the Father for you. Where he sees you, he knows where you were, he knows how you were despondent, how you felt bad, shame, that those things that should have worked did not work. He picked you out from the multitude, he picked you out from the crowd. And he put his hand upon you and he said, bring your boat, bring that assignment, surrender it afresh to me. I want to walk again with you. And then I told you how you must separate yourself from the crowd. You must enter into consecration. You've taken the right first step. We are here, tabernacling with the Lord, pushing, pressing for a spiritual awakening. But it goes beyond today. It goes beyond tomorrow. It goes into a lifestyle of consecration. A lifestyle where you separate yourself so that you can hear the master speak to you, refresh you, speak over your head, renew hope, rekindle light, rekindle courage. And then when he knows that you are ready, launch out into the deep. No more shallow waters. No more doing things because they are convenient. Eh? Amen? No more comfort zone. I do want to warn you that be careful what amen you say because the Lord will, he's, he's writing it down. He said amen in the awakening, let's go. But for what it is that you want to enter into, you cannot do it from your comfort zone. It's possible. It's not, it's not, it's not going to work. I was thinking this morning as I round up that favor is expensive. Favor is expensive. We pray for favor. But favor requires you to realize that there's something different about you. It requires you to pray when everybody else is playing. It requires you to study. It requires you to work hard. It requires you to look crazy for a season. It requires you to embrace the fact that you are different. Favor is expensive. All the people, it requires you to lay your life down. Favor is expensive. But I say to you, never in the history of all anybody in the Bible that said, if I perish, I perish. Nobody perished. Nobody perished. Nobody perished. Instead, they entered into next level. Esther went from being a queen to being a deliverer of her people. The four lepers went from being lepers to being the ones that brought the good news that what? Abundance had come. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If I perish, I perish. They went to seeing the fourth man in the fire and coming out without the smell of smoke. For what is required for this next season, it will require you to say, I'm tired. If I perish, I perish. But what God has spoken over my life must come to pass. I'm tired of promises not coming into fulfillment. Whatever I need to do, whoever I need to be, whatever I need to pray, however I need to fast, however I need to position myself, my nevertheless, whatever those moments are, I enter into it. And when I wonder how shall these things be, I remind myself that the how is the person of the Holy Spirit. The answer to the how questions in your life, how, how God, how, how do I go from here to there, is in the person of the Holy Spirit. Is in the person of the Holy Spirit. Is in the person of the Holy Spirit. As I round up, I just want us to pray two prayers in Luke chapter 1. Because the Lord said to me, he said, listen, Esther, if you're going to be a different person at the end of the year, we're going to birth it in this month of March. We have nine months to birth this thing. So I thank God because he used January and February as a trial period. March, we're going to birth. And so if you turn to me, and, and it's, so when I was thinking, I was like, of course, it makes sense that they did the awakening in March. Because you must be awakened and you must birth all that God requires for you to birth before the end of this year. 2024 must indeed be a different year for you in Jesus' name. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Okay, so Luke chapter 1. Everybody. Yeah. 
Yes, Luke chapter 1. Huh. It says, so we know this story, right? The angel of the Lord appears, and we talk about how favor makes you first afraid before you now realize that, oh, actually, God is in the room. But then the Lord now begins to describe to her what he wants her to birth in this season. And I believe that in this room, the Lord wants to birth saviors through us, saviors in tech, saviors in entertainment, saviors in Nollywood, saviors in healthcare, saviors in the church, saviors. He wants to birth things that will transform the landscape of the industries, the spaces and places that he has called us to. He wants to birth it in and through us. But then, verse 34, Luke chapter 1, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And I put it to you that some of us know too many men. We know somebody that will help us do this. We know a person for that. We have a this for that. And if God is going to be merciful to you in this season, he's going to make sure that the hand of flesh will fail you. It's not a curse. It is actually a sign of his favor. Because for what he wants to do in and through you, only he can take the glory. And so some of the disappointments that you have been experiencing has actually been the favor of God speaking over your life. Because your assignment is too big for any human being to say, I'm the one that did it for them. And so today, very quickly, we're going to repent of every time we have trusted in a man over God. We're going to say, Lord, I decree and I declare that I know not a man. I do not know what? A man. I don't know a man. I don't know anybody. Else. If you don't help me, I can't be helped. If you don't save me, I can't be saved. If you don't deliver me, I can't be delivered. And so, Lord, wherever I put my trust in any uncle, any pastor, any mentor, anybody, any, any official, Lord, I repent. I repent, I repent in Jesus' name, amen. The how, so she asked a question, how? And verse 35 says, the angel answered and said to her, the how is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the highest will overshadow you. The power of the highest, meaning after him there's no other power. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Judges 6 verse 34 says, And the angel, or the, the power of the Lord came upon Gideon and wore him like a glove. I said, Lord, I don't just want the power to be upon me. Wear me like a glove. Show up. When people ask me how, Holy Spirit, answer them in the name of Jesus. When they ask me how shall these things be, Holy Spirit, answer in the name of Jesus. Release to me strategies. Release to me direction. Release to me clarity. Release to me help. Release to me an overwhelming understanding that you are in my boat in the name of Jesus. Lord, the how, let the how be you. Overpower me, overshadow me in the name of Jesus. Lastly, Esther chapter 9 verse 1 says, In the 13th year and the 12th month or 12th day, the day that the enemies of the Jews were supposed to overpower them, it says, the opposite occurred. I decree and I declare over us that everything that has caused us to be anxious, to be afraid, not to trust God, not to put all our eggs in his basket, I decree and I declare that you have an overwhelming understanding now that the opposite occurs in the name of Jesus. That thing that has kept you awake, made you have sleepless nights, saying, God, if this thing happens, where will I be? I decree and I declare concerning you now that the opposite occurs in Jesus' name. You are equipped. Everything that you need for this season and beyond is already on you, is already in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit. You have wisdom, you have clarity, you have direction. You know what to do and when to do it in the name of Jesus. I release unto you the power for divine timing in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that whenever there's an opportunity, your spirit of discernment will be heightened in the name of Jesus. You will not bow to this economy.